favorite part when you just like really yeah this is the room hi talk? go for it so wait introduce yourself <laughs> first hey i'm liz wolf um i work at reason uh oh and oh, at clubhouse hold basically on. <laughs> you want to talk about how we tech we have? we're supposed to put on our headphones oh, that's shit. how good we are at the tech i hope nobody's watching See? oh they're all, watching. Oh, they're all watching they're all watching three okay. people are watching hi uh yeah that's C. C. liz was just uh uh complimenting my tech <laughs> and I, before we even get to anything, I, I've put this online before, but I, now I'm begging. Like, seriously, if there's someone here in New York City that can help me with tech, I really, I'll make you cookies. I really, really would appreciate it. But um, but we're here now live, and we'll just do our best. So anyway, here with Liz Wolf, hey. staff editor at Reason yep. Magazine. Staff editor at Reason, uh, creature of Clubhouse, generally just hanging out in Brooklyn slash Texas. Uh, yeah, Clubhouse. So Liz and I, for the past three weeks, have been doing something Mondays, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time on Clubhouse. Basically, like, journalism talk. And, man, did we get a lot of people last week. Um, like, 3,000 people? Yeah, it was something crazy like that. I mean, we had a really, like, well-attended room. I think Eric Weinstein's comments yeah. were especially helpful. He's super insightful. We sometimes run into a little bit of the echo chamber groupthink type situation. And I feel like he added some really... Um, complicating points in a really good way. Yeah, and it's also, you know, think big clubhouse is like somebody big like Eric goes someplace and everybody follows. So you think yeah. it's, you think we're, we're just going to take credit for it. it really wasn't. Okay. Um, not. <laughs> I think we're going to start a new little uh, a tradition here on the Paloma Media Podcast. We're going to tell people what we're drinking because we are. So Liz, would you like to tell people what we're drinking here? We are drinking a Banyas Mezcal that my husband bought last night. Um, we tried it. I've been in Texas for the past month, and Nancy's been in Mexico, so it seemed like Mexico was fitting. Seems like we should have some Mexico. So cheers to you guys. Delicious. Okay, so again, thanks for joining us. And please subscribe. I will be very bald about it. We're trying to get 2,000 subscribers by the end of March. We're about halfway there. So um, go ahead and hit that, hit that subscribe <laughs> button. It's free. Okay, so what are we talking about today, Liz Wolf? Oh, God. We're talking about... New York and Texas, honestly, like my two favorite states and political situations that I follow really closely. But the allegations against Cuomo that have surfaced this past week, interestingly, they're being presented as a new news story. But Lindsay Boylan, uh, one of the main people who sort of like lodged allegations against him, she actually previewed some of these back in December, I believe. Mm -hmm. So this is something, you know, as is usual, as is typical with a lot of Cuomo related controversy, some things have sort of been open secrets for a while, but it takes some time uh, for them to sort of percolate through the discourse and for sort of national news media to actually begin to pay a little bit more attention. Well, I think one of the reasons, too, I think it was only a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago that she took her um, her story to Medium.com. And Medium, for the past couple of years, has become the place, I mean, or one of the places, the one of the ones that I know of, that when you have a, a grievance with somebody, very often, the ones at least that I'm following, it's a gal um, who's had some sort of sexual harassment or perceived sexual harassment issue with someone. Often they're true. Sometimes maybe they're not. But um, you go there and there is a real appetite and audience for this. Um, I talked to Matt uh, Welch on one of these. We were, we were discussing someone's essay there. And like I've written for Medium and maybe I get like, yay, 48 claps. Like Lindsay, she, you get 10,000 when you post these things. People yeah. really want to hear about it. They really want to support you. They really want to know the details. Of course, it can, it, it, it's a complicated issue well, as these stories are. But there's she, a value add to it, right? Because it's people who are making specific allegations and able to do so completely in their own voice with their own supporting evidence, framing it the way that they see fit as opposed to having a journalist or editor middleman. And often they use the phrase, which is a phrase that kind of bums me out, which is my truth or our truth or their truth, because that's, again, it's like, well, sure. Okay. So it's, it's your turn on the box, right? You're, you're, you're going to be able to tell your story, but you know, sometimes as a journalist, you'd like a little more, like a little more balance. Yeah. But um, anyway, she didn't have um, very happy things to say about Cuomo. Yeah, she absolutely did not. Um, the thing that's sort of frustrating me about all of this is that basically so it's her and then what's Bennett's first name? Uh, Charlotte. Charlotte, Charlotte Bennett, Bennett, who have both come forward basically discussing Cuomo's inappropriate sexual questioning and posturing and positioning in the workplace. Some of these things, it's a little bit hard to discern the degree to which they are off the cuff, a, a sort of meant to tone be deaf. quippy, tone deaf comments, like the strip poker comment, for example. I did not interpret that as a genuine, authentic strip 
poker suggestion. at all. You're on a plane with a bunch of people. It's like, ah, oh, let's play strip poker. I mean, yeah. I, I completely agree with you. Their comment, I was like, that's not something that I would even register. If I had a private jet, I would play strip poker. <laughs> but Hello. I mean, not if I were, you know, <laughs> elected to office or with coworkers like that. Or, or the, the really important component of this is that he, you know, these are subordinates, right? He's the boss and they're the employees. Right. Uh, at Reason, we try really, really hard not to, you know, say stuff like that to each other. That's just not sort of like a common thing that people say. Um, that's the dynamic that I have with my colleague. And I imagine it's easy to feel uh, like, especially when there's a string or a pattern of questionable comments made like that, it's fair that Boylan was left with a very sour taste in her mouth. And then ultimately, these things did escalate, right? So this escalated and resulted in, at some point in private, uh, Cuomo kissing Boylan on the lips. Um, which is which pretty, was unwanted in private. And it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I mean, kissing someone on the lips isn't like she misinterpreted what I was doing. Yeah. Like, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to make anybody feel that way. Well, I can get that. Like, you know, he's 60 something. She's 30 or whatever, like different languages. We're in a different era. Yeah. Kissing someone on the lips is pretty straightforward. Yeah. There's also this component to it that kind of really bothers me about people giving their own accounts of what happened, which is that if I were the journalists reporting the story, I think I would try to be sparing with the amount of, he made a joke about strip poker type things, and I would really focus on the meat of the complaint, which is the times when he inappropriately, you know, queried her about her sex life, as well as the unwanted kiss in private. I, but I think, like, I don't remember, I could be wrong. I don't know if I might be conflating. The yeah, it, but it, it's all, it's all sort of the same. Yeah. To here, but yeah, I think the, okay. at least what I recall uh, Charlotte Bennett was the one, was the one with the inappropriate. And that's, that's one thing I want to talk about that because yeah. that fascinated me for different reasons. But Lindsay Boylan, I think, was the one that she said he kept trying to, like, uh, just take the opportunity mm -hmm. to touch my leg, to touch my yeah. hair, to touch my neck, you know, which is what you do when you want to touch someone. Yeah. So um, and that but, you know, she worked for him and obviously mm -hmm. she didn't know what to do about it. She maybe yeah. I mean, she's saying she didn't. Maybe she felt her job was in jeopardy. Do I just have to do this? She's claiming that other people in the office, you know, saw this and said to her, yeah, I've had this happen too, but they didn't want to give their names yeah. or she didn't want to reveal their names, but they saw it as a pattern. And she, when was this though? It wasn't super recent, was it? Was, wasn't it 2018, 2019-ish? I might be getting those dates wrong. I think she left in 2018, but she's also running for a, yeah, yeah. That's the part that's really that's tough, right? Like right. it's tough to figure out how to adjudicate that or how to weigh that. And that sounds like we're being, you know, I don't know, crass dismissive, or yeah. dismissive of her. But hi, it's politics. Okay. You know, yeah. she. We know this game a little bit. A little bit. Right. So she is now, um, I mean, I'd never heard of her. I live in New York City. I'd never heard of her. I've heard of her. She followed me on Twitter and I checked out her campaign a little bit. Oh, well, yeah. you, you see, you're more popular than no, I am. Liz. No, no. You're more useful than I am. I, I, I don't think so. I think you're the most useful. <laughs> I would use I, you anytime. Use me, Liz. <laughs> um, no, but I think there is. So she is angling herself as a fairly intensely progressive candidate. Um, and I think, is she running for city council? City council, or, I think? And she, a, a commenter says that she had an unsuccessful congressional run. I'm not totally sure if that's true. but yeah, you know, I don't all, know. I, we'll, we'll check up on that later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, she's somebody who's angling to have a career in politics uh, and seemed to be decently senior-ish uh, in the, she ran against Nadler. Okay, interesting. Okay. Um, oh, you see my, I said it's not good. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> nearsighted as a bat, so you have to read the comments. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's this other side and I don't know how to weigh that. I feel as though you weight, you weight it too heavily and you you run the risk of being inappropriately and wrongly dismissive and cynical right but, but if you also don't consider that component to it at all i think you might be getting an incomplete sense of the story i it's a factor i agree um i want to talk a little bit so i actually i've been in, i was in mexico i really i was writing about the donald McNeil stuff i really wasn't paying that much attention to this because i am well, i want to get to this i i have true antipathy for cuomo for other reasons um Yes, the reason we will I, get to right the reasons I think he should actually be you know shuffled out the side door. Um, but as someone said to me because I've written about this stuff before and written you know people and allegations, some true, some not true. Um, and I read Charlotte's account first mm -hmm. before I read Lindsay's, and I thought it really was pretty credible. Mm -hmm. I I was surprised. I was ready to be like, oh goodness, are we going to get another pile on? This happened 17 years ago. And it's like, okay, uh, but it really wasn't. It sounded to me, 
it sounded to me familiar, uh, not with Andrew Cuomo, God, but uh, as I was saying to you uh, a few minutes ago, um, in my experience, um, you sometimes have like older guys, and I'm pretty old myself now, but uh, they, they have this thing where they feel like, and it's not even just that they want to come on to you. It's almost like this. In it's peacocking of it sorts. Is, but it's almost like this imperative, like me, guy, pretty woman, must somehow be impressive. But they're impressive in this, or impressive in this way. It's like they want to tell you about their sex life and they want to know about yours. And you're like, <coughs> like I'm going to give an example that I think will, will encapsulate it. I was once driving a, a male in-law who I will not name. I was in the car. And I was driving, and he's Wait, twenty. A male in law. Uh, this like narrows. Down yeah, the I know, I know. Uh, uh, he's like twenty years older than me, and he says to me, "Well, you know, my ex wife from a billion years ago. I never knew her, or whatever. You know, she contacted me. She said, you know what? I really miss your penis.'" And I was like, "Okay, I will now be driving into head-on traffic because this was so appalling to me. What could possibly make someone say this?" to a woman 20 years his journey. Like what yeah. possible thinking can go into this to make her gonna be somewhere hot? Like Yeah. There's I mean, is it an attempt to assert themselves as I mean people when people run up against like the fear of mortality, they begin to do batshit crazy mm -hmm. things. Is it that sense of like loss of libido, loss of you were saying earlier, loss of virility that makes people feel as though they need to you know, posture themselves as something other than what they are because they're afraid of confronting that. Or something they were, or maybe something they never were. Yeah. But it's like, I, I, I it's... A, it's inappropriate behavior. It's they're not considering the recipient at all. It's completely inappropriate <laughs> and it's completely disgusting. Yeah. So when Cuomo was... What is that, guys? I don't know. It's right on feedback. Is that coming from the computer? Oh, no. <laughs> it's this room. It's, it's outside? <laughs> no, it's this room. Wait, what's happening? I think the the mouse is taken over and oh, now we're hostage. I have a mouse in the kitchen. Help! Help! No. What? I mean, it's well, New York. Who okay, we're going to keep talking. <laughs> Sorry, we're near an air shaft. I don't know if you guys Sony can hear it. Banshee. Sony says Banshee. Radio here. It's not. It's like a, it's an air shaft over there. Help! <laughs> um... Uh, wait, where were we? God is punishing us. We're yeah, being God, smited. So we're sorry. finally I mean, being smited. Um, <laughs> uh, the inappropriate behavior. Um, I don't know. We were... No, it's there's something... People aren't considering the recipient when they're communicating like this inappropriately and they're jeopardizing a relationship and they're... I mean, the, the, the main thing that I just want to keep turning back to is this isn't how you're supposed to treat your employees if you're no. somebody's boss. Like, there's this base level... I mean, if, if we do believe that character matters in politics... And, you know, we believe that Amy Klobuchar throwing her binders at her, like, staffers is a completely inappropriate thing to do. We should consider that, like, Cuomo is, has this past of intimidating people like Assemblymember Ron Kim and uh, threatening, you know, political opponents or people who criticize him in public, as well as treating young, attractive female staffers in a completely disrespectful, inappropriate way that makes them fear retribution and not know how to, you know, what recourse they have available to them. They're, you know, potentially even warning each other about his behavior, trying to make sure people aren't alone with him. Like, that's not a healthy work environment created by him. I think it's also, it's so disingenuous. Like, he's saying to her, I mean, you guys should go read, like, what she's saying. Yeah. He's like, so, yeah, so, um, oh, you're, are you monogamous uh, with your boyfriend? Yeah. So, do you, do you like to sleep with older guys? Like, you know, I, I, I'm 63 or whatever it was at the time, 61, yeah. and, uh, like, for me, the cutoff is, like, you know, 22, because she was 25. Why don't you just say to her, you know what? I'd like to date you. Yeah. Instead of all this this stuff to make her, it's yeah. almost like he's asserting his, like, like he's going to have no, um, uh, there's no repercussions for it. It's, it was so, and it's, it was gross, and it was wrong. And that made me really, it made me, I found her very believable. Now, yeah. the third allegation is a little... Weird. Speaking you, of older men being gross and wrong, Matt Welch is talking some shit about me in the comments over here. I'm just what? <laughs> Matt Welch, what are you doing? Is he on here? Make sure you not to distract me with chats. This is a reference to a work meeting where okay. he is an in, yeah, insubordinate. Matt Welch. Uh, 
terrible. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, so the so the third one was interesting, and this I was I had a conversation with this uh, with Bacha, my editor, at Newsweek yesterday. So the third one is a woman at a wedding. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I'm just gonna posit that one, and now he's the governor, so he's got to keep his nose clean, which he doesn't. But like, you're at a wedding. All kinds of shit happens at weddings. People are wearing little bits of clothing, and they're getting drunk, and they're grabbing each other, and they're dancing. They're going home with the best man. Like, not that I would ever do that, but um, you know, it's like, and she says he touched her on the back. Okay, yeah, not not yeah. maybe a great thing to do, but like maybe a lot of people are touching. I don't know. I don't like touchy people in general. I wish oh, they would always. Is stop. that why you work with Catherine? This is how you get hired with Catherine Mangu Ward. Catherine hates, and I have never touched touch each other, and I don't think we ever will. And I think that's a perfectly like that's a wonderful relationship. <laughs> so if I went for a job, okay, how do you feel about personal touching? Yeah. Oh, I'm for it. I'm sorry. Let's just say I've never been touched by a boss. I think that's a wonderful I thing. I think that's a good thing. It's great. Um, but uh. Now, can I kiss you? I think he said, can I kiss you? Yeah. I mean, I, it's kind of gross and kind of ridiculous, and maybe because now we're seeing like it's a pattern, but, you know, they're at a wedding. He, she doesn't work for him. Yeah, it's inappropriate because he's the governor, but, like, this particular thing struck me as, like, I know she didn't like it. I yeah. get that. I even, like, especially at the end when she's like, I even went to look for him afterwards to tell him, don't do that. And, I, you know, that thing when something happens, yeah. you're like, why didn't I tell them at the time? But um, I didn't find that as egregious. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is the weakest of all allegations. The main factor that we have to consider with all of the, or with the first two allegations is, this is not how you treat people who work for you, especially if you're the governor. But the thing that's bothering me about all of this is that I'm a little bit worried that all of these sexual assault related allegations, which are fair and reasonable for people to care about, they're distracting from the main point, which is that he is a terrible, terrible governor for a whole bunch yeah. of reasons. And we already knew about them before this. And those reasons, just to be really clear, are his March 25th directive, where he told hospitals uh, to release COVID positive patients and that they could be readmitted into nursing homes without having done COVID testing. So they weren't really isolated. Sometimes those nursing homes weren't even aware of what the test, you know, they weren't even aware of what the COVID status of that patient was or, or that new resident. So there's this problem where we saw unprecedented, enormous, terrifying spread in nursing homes as a result of this directive, which a lot of other governors handled that very differently. But Cuomo specifically said, you can readmit them into nursing homes. You don't need to follow this protocol. You don't need to test them and make sure they're COVID negative before they go back to nursing homes. And then to make matters worse, what he did is he undercounted the death toll to the tune of 4,000 or 5,000, more, more Six, than that. 6,500. So his Holy original shit. death toll was 8,500 and now it's 15,000. So what it's he- It's disturbing. He, he covered this up. And right. so then it finally took, he didn't respond to public records requests. To be clear, like Janice Dean from Fox was on this from the get-go because she lost both of her in-laws who died in two separate nursing home facilities in New York. This is, the, this is the story, you guys. This is the story. Cuomo not only made it so that more old people died, uh, seemingly potentially preventable deaths, he then lied about it and covered it up to save his own skin. So the way he covered it up, or one of the ways he covered it up was like, so I'm an old person in a nursing home and I get COVID and they send me to the hospital where I mm -hmm. die. Well, that was counted as a hospital death. Yep. That's like saying if you eat in a, our restaurant and you get food poisoning, but you vomit in the parking lot, it's like it's the parking lot's problem, yeah. right? Or it's so, certainly not our problem. Yeah, it not shouldn't our be problem. linked to us at so, all. And, he, and the thing is that they deliberately covered this up and it got exposed by one of his own a deputy of some sort. I don't remember who it was. It was in his administration, right, that, yeah. that released it. Um, so, you know, Catherine Mangu Ward, I thought, spoke beautifully about you should all be listening to the Reason Roundtable podcast. Uh, they tape it on Monday mornings. It's out on uh, on uh, Monday afternoons. I listened to it today and she was talking about exactly what we're going to talk about. It's like, look, yes, these accusations of racism, of, of, of you know, of um, sexual harassment, they come in, they immolate people's lives super quick and you are out the door. Hi, Donald McNeil. Hi, James Bennett, whatever it is. And these things work. And that's why people, I mean, sometimes why people use them, that's a whole nother story. But the reason to get Cuomo out, sure, he's gross. And yeah, but get him out for the things for killing thousands of people. Isn't that, isn't that a, a little more important that we have to pay attention to that as opposed to being like, okay, well now we have the reason. Yeah. It's the thing that's so bothersome to me is that like, if you want ways to impugn his character or to, to call him a bad guy, you have ample, ample reasons. And you've that's had right. that for a really long time. 
He bullies and threatens political opponents. He does not treat, uh, you know, younger women in their 20s and 30s who work for him well. Uh, he is so completely like full of himself that he wrote a book during the pandemic about his leadership successes. And then he won an Emmy, allegedly, I guess, for his for his updates, for his with his brother. No, no, no. For his updates, I think, oh, of, the, of keeping oh. New Yorkers okay. informed. Okay. And then the whole brother stick. Don't even get me started on that of like, who does mom love more? And the big Q-tip gag thing about him having a big nose. He needed a Q-tip this big. And Chris Cuomo came prepared with the prop. And it's just like, it's Chris, nice Chris to Cuomo me. is so gross. I have to say, I only saw that shtick like once or twice. It didn't really bother me that much. A billion things were going on with COVID. Everyone's life was upside down. But um I I actually I don't know if I ever tuned into one of his daily press conferences, but it absolutely baffles me that anybody would have had. I mean, that's how much you're looking for a hero. That's how yeah. much that that he's that not your guy. <laughs> Andrew Cuomo is the guy that you're going to have a crush on, guys. Man, there's a lot of other other people that are not so mercenary and more more honest. But I guess he wasn't Donald Trump, right? So. Yeah, I that mean, was, uh, but he's not, in my view, he's not that different in demeanor and in vibe and no. in strong manness compared to Trump. I mean, you even saw this come out, this mean streak come out when he started, you know, yelling at reporters who dared to ask him per perfectly like inane questions about COVID and reopening and schools and how they were calculating case counts and how they were shutting down different parts of New York City. And there's just something absolutely astonishing to me about if you're looking for evidence that Cuomo is a bad leader or a bad guy, you have it. And but you've let's had just, it. Yeah, you, you've had it for you've a long it. time. But let's just be clear that the main reason why you should be pissed off at this guy is because he had a responsibility early in the pandemic to do a good job and to handle how do you release patients from hospitals back into nursing homes? How do you isolate? How do you test? How do you make sure this virus remains contained? He failed to do that. And a bunch of people died. And then he lied about it and he asked his staff to lie about it. And then he's failed to respond to public records requests that would communicate to everybody just how much he's lied about it. Like this is this is not acceptable behavior for public officials to ever engage in. And we have to hold people to a high standard. You could oppose Trump and you could oppose Cuomo. And just to put the cherry on that Sunday, he writes a book about how yeah. heroically he, he dealt with the pandemic. Of course. So uh, maybe we'll jump uh, lanes right now and talk about so another governor that's trying to deal with heroic with, with the pandemic. So you are a Texan. Yes. You know a lot more about this than I do, but I have some opinions about it. That's why we're <laughs> here. So uh, go. So basically, I guess sometime this week, uh, Governor Abbott, Greg Abbott in Texas announced that COVID is over, basically. Um, no more <laughs> masks required, uh, no more mask mandate, uh, easing up all COVID restrictions, going to 100% capacity in bars and restaurants, um, a pretty aggressive move sort of out of step with other Republican governors at this point. And he took a ton of flack for it, uh, like an insane amount. I'm seeing, you know, I, I had random people from Texas texting me about this, people who I don't really text with politics about who were just like blowing up my phone for some, you know, God knows what reason. But people are really indignant and fiery and outraged about this. But I do think it's worth considering the the two the two major points here are I know this isn't actually going to change things that much because my Instagram feed was immediately filled with Austin area restaurants. I used to live in Austin, Austin area restaurants doing half a mix of virtue signaling and half a mix of legitimately like easing the fears of their customers saying, don't worry, we still believe in science. We will absolutely be enforcing masks. We expect you to wear masks while ordering and masks when going to the bathroom and masks when you're not seated at your table, blah, 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 between blah, between bites. Oh well, yeah, I mean no, but it's it's perfectly reasonable for ma for mask wearing to be accepted, and for a private business to say, "Hey, this is the cost of doing business with us." Like, if mm -hmm. you're a sure. customer, you deserve. I mean, everybody sure. has a different COVID risk tolerance, and I think it was. I didn't. I follow probably twenty or thirty bars and restaurants in Austin on Instagram. I haven't seen a single one that has said, "Yeah, now we're going to roll back mask expectations." I've seen a ton specifically jumping to clarify that they will be fully 100% expecting the exact same level of mask wearing that they expected before. And then also the national chains that are in yeah. in Texas or, yeah. you know, like what was like, I don't know, CVS or exactly. some chain restaurants. I know we're, you know, we're, yeah. and I understand, I mean, they're national. They have to like have one, they can't go state by state. Well, so the thing that nobody's answering for me is just like, I was just in Austin last week. If I go around Austin this week or next week, how much will actually be different in terms of my experience and what I'll be expected to do and how much mask wearing will be, you know, sort of part of the culture? I really, really don't think, especially in places like Austin, I don't think much will change. 
the other thing that we have to contend with, and I think you've alluded to this a little bit, is, hey, guys, like there are a whole bunch of places in Texas where a mask mandate might have been in full force where nobody was enforcing it and people were drinking and smoking and hanging out at dive bars in Dallas, Fort Worth or whatever. And nobody gives a shit about masks. And so the, you know, the proprietors of it didn't require their customers to wear it and nobody ever called the cops and no one's enforcement ever happened. And the people who feel comfortable with that go to that. And the people who don't, don't. Mm -hmm. And like, this is already something that's happening all over the place. I mean, I even went to a bar. I personally don't feel comfortable spending time indoors, even at my beloved dive bars. I went to a dive bar for the outdoor space and was, you know, hanging out with my husband we had a conversation with a random stranger for like an hour, which like, it feels like a little relic of the pre-pandemic era. Like I miss that sort of thing. It felt a little bit normal, but like inside guys, like, was it packed? Hell yeah, it was like, let's just be clear. Like the people who are comfortable with that are doing that already, even in liberal strongholds like Austin and even in places where there are mask mandates. And in New York city. So I remember it was supposed to be on February 14th. It was going to be 25% indoor dining was going to start being allowed. Well, I was walking around on February 12th. And every place that I passed, Lower East Side in Chinatown, was packed. Inside, yeah. completely packed. And then Go to the uh, West Village on the weekends. Holy shit. No, completely. <laughs> and then someone said to me, oh, no, they, they moved it up to the 12th. Okay, fine. That, yeah. But, I mean, the idea that it was going to be at 25%, it, it, it's absolutely ludicrous. I was actually at a, a birthday dinner for someone that Matt Welch was actually there, too. We went in this restaurant. Okay. Not only was every table packed. But they had a band, like a loud, loud band, and a girl in a silver shimmery dress going between the tables. I mean, literally. Was she were... wearing a mask? No. Darn it. I love those mask strip clubs they, they were doing in Portland at the beginning. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome, right? I have nothing on. No pasties, no G-string, but I got my mask. It's kind of hot, actually, right? But, um, but no, they were literally dancing girls in the aisles wearing spangles because that is where people are at. And I have a very, I'm going to get a lot of hell for this. And I, I actually am going to, I'm going to say this. Um, do you know the number? So more than half a million people have died of COVID in the United States. Mm -hmm. Do you know the age breakdown? Like, like over 65, what percentage of that? It's an enormous percentage. So it's like, something like 85, 90-ish. Okay. So here's a question. And I, I posed this yesterday and, and I, I'm wondering how people feel about this. And of course, we have to qualify it by saying, like, we don't, we didn't know what COVID was about. We knew it was pretty bad. We knew it was killing people, old people, really quickly. So you do have to take certain precautions. And I think instinctually, we had those precautions. Like, we were all out in early March, and boom, March 9th came. We all went in the house for two months. Like, our our bodies told us to do this, not the news media so much. Like, we, and then, you know, maybe we started coming out. Anyway, what if, like, early on in the pandemic, uh, whether it was the CDC or some other organization said, look, guys, it's a bad flu. It's a really bad. Flu. It's a bad flu that kills old people. Like doesn't just make them sick. This is a it, spicy take. It kills them. All right. It kills them. So you have to be really, really careful with your olds. You got to do it. The rest of you carry on. So you're basically arguing for I'm containment of old people at what age point? Like at what, what's the, I don't know, 65, 70, 75. Yeah. I, I meant, I'm sorry. I meant to look up numbers before we, uh, we were, sorry, we were distracted by the missed call. No, no. Um, I, I, because I'm wondering, you know, we've obviously seen, you know, giant portions of the economy wrecked. We've seen the school system. It's, it's a disaster. We've seen serious impacts that I hope um, kids are resilient and elastic enough to come back from. We're going, you know, inevitably, from tragedy, there will be interesting things. Maybe we'll have like more interesting ways of educating our kids because we're going to realize we're going to take some control of that. All oh, that's great. There'll be, you know, there will be some positive things maybe that come out of this. But I'm just wondering, you know, the damage has been pretty severe in a lot of areas for a particular demographic that was was perishing from this. And you've been extremely uh, um, adamant about like we've got to we've got to give the vaccines to the old. Like we yeah. have to do that. Mm -hmm. So if we had concentrated our energies on the population that was that pretty quickly into the pandemic, we knew were the ones that were seriously at risk as opposed to like blanketing everybody. Would it have been a better use of resources, a, a, a more net positive than we've seen? I'm curious about that. I mean, I... Uh... I feel like the challenging thing about that is that it is like a shitty, shitty ethical dilemma that we're in because it 
this virus does work. I, I don't want to say it works in random ways, but there are some, that's a rough heuristic to follow or a rough guideline to follow of if you're above 65, you should be really concerned. I mean, I even remember my in-laws, I looked this up for them because I was curious about it. My mother-in-law's chance of dying if she contracts COVID compared to my chance of dying age bracket wise, she's 90 times more likely. Yeah. And somebody just a little bit older than her would be 220 times more likely. Like This is an order of magnitude difference. Uh, my in-laws are especially old. They're in their 70s. And so a big motivator for me personally taking it seriously has been I want to make sure that I can have social contact with them. Sure. And so I do some amount of like, you know, risk medication, et cetera, in order to uh, be respectful of their risk appetites and also be respectful of the fact that their odds are so much different than mine are. But I do think that's a really interesting question. I mean, the challenge, though, is that there are some people in their 30s and 40s who do die. And there are some long haulers who have symptoms for a really long time, which I think is totally it's overhyped by the media. But it is a thing that exists. It is. But, you you know, know, there's there's risk. In everything. I mean, you, you've heard, um, we were talking about something. Oh, about this, somebody said ages 45 to 64, 81,000 81, have died, rounding up to 82. Okay, that's interesting. All right, well, that's, so 82 that's a lot. So that's, of the 515,000. That's like a, almost a fifth of the deaths. Yeah. So that's, that's a lot. That's so useful that's, information. That's really. Oh, like, under, so under 45, 12,000. Okay, so that that's really, really interesting, right? But then the question is also, like, where do you draw the line? Like, what amount of risk right. is enough? Well, I think we do. I mean, there was some teachers union. So let's not get started with the teachers union. But oh, somebody, so let's, please not. That's another episode. Neither of us have kids <laughs> in I school. Do. I don't have kids in school. No, like, you know, neither yeah. of us are, like, affected parents, and yet we're still so We're so angry. Oh, <laughs> I'm so pissed but, um, I can't get over it. Um. God, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, no, no it's just the, the allocation of resources. Yeah. You know, we've, we've put so much time and energy and advertising and, and medications and just so much stuff into everybody. It's like if you have 100 hungry people, but 10 of them are actually starving. Yeah. Like, you want to feed the 10 starving people first, right? Or the people that are on fire and the people that are not quite on fire. Like, you want to put the people that are on fire out first. So I'm just wondering if we could have... Um, Obviously, been so much conflicting information. It became political because everything becomes political, or even especially more when when Trump was still president. But I just, I just wonder now that we're coming out of it, and most of us really have come out of it, you know, yeah. and are will come out of it, um, banged and bruised, but okay. Um, I just wonder. I just wonder if we could have done a better job. So the thing that's interesting to me about this is, to a degree. People's indi- like what you're talking about, people's individual behavior has reflected their risk appetite. And I think their risk yeah. appetite has yeah. been informed by the number of people or the percentage of people who contract COVID in their age bracket who are dying from it, right? Like mm-hmm. you, I think, are probably an outlier for your age demographic in terms of just being like, I mean, you've taken how many flights during the pandemic? Uh, I've been to Portland back and forth four or five times, and I've been to Mexico twice. And yeah. I just had my eighth negative COVID test on nice, Friday. Dude. So. Well, you've also, the thing that I keep emphasizing to people, and I think you're a good example of this, I know Matt Welch is too, it's, I think, okay, maybe even good to engage in social behavior, yep. social activity, if you're also testing testing yourself regularly, so you have a sense of, you know, obviously tests are a snapshot in time, but a lot of people, like, I, I interact with friends in other parts of the country where they're, like, super, like, don't see anybody, no masks off, no indoors, yeah. all these things. And then my question to them is, oh, so you test yourself, too. And the answer is always them feeling a little bit like they've been caught red-handed. And I'm like, you know what? Like, I have my little COVID bubble in New York, and probably that's subject to change, and it's going to loosen up a little bit. But when things are really bad, I had my little COVID bubble, and it was us and another couple. And we had an awesome time. And of course we hung out indoors and we tested ourselves at right. ourselves every so often. And every once in a while we would do something similar with other people. And then after that, we would test ourselves we again. We would test it again. You know? so it's, I had a, it's not a hard format to figure out if little, you have insurance or if you have the ability to pay or if, if you want to stand in line to do free testing. Yeah. I had a little piece in the New York Post on Saturday talking about just Chinatown, how Chinatown, where I live, where we are right now, um, it really kept going. I mean, other parts of the city were just completely shutting down. Can't buy any toilet paper. No, that Chinatown like kind of kept going, and I don't know if because I live here if that infected me or if just my general nature does. But come May, I was actually in Portland for a couple of months from March to May. But when I got back, I was like, now people start coming over for lunch, Tuesday lunches, and I had almost everyone said yes. There was one or two people that said I would love to, but I can't because I've got my grandmother in the house, and I just feel weird. Almost and the every, dog ate their homework. The dog and, ate the homework, yeah. Um, almost everyone came and they said, this is my first outing. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm glad. Let's have lunch. We're not going to French kiss. 
Okay, we're not going to use the same spoon. We're not Cuomo. Yeah, yeah. Crying out. What, did I ask to kiss you on the lips? I did not. Well, you wouldn't ask. Yes, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but you know what? It's like we do, and 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 one thing that I think we're we've all been saying, and Reason has been saying a lot too, is like yeah. there is so much good news, guys. Like so much good news. Have you heard the good news? Have you? Heard? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know what you mean. I grew up in Brooklyn Heights. Yeah, Boston. right. Jehovah's <laughs> Witness. Have you heard the good news? Have well, no, totally. I don't yeah. want to cut you off. No, no. I was just going to say, like, <laughs> guys, there is so much good news, and I do understand how and why people are clinging on to the idea that whether they're afraid, whether it's misinformation, whether they feel like they're being a good person to continue with certain protocols. I get it. But other people that feel otherwise, that they really feel like it's time to come out of the chrysalis now yeah. and bang into spring, I think that the science and the numbers support that and and that we should be following, you know, uh, again, you know, I, I want other people who feel comfortable. I wear a mask. But, like, I was out in Mexico. I was walking along the, the Malacan in La Paz. I didn't wear a mask. Yeah. I was in the open air by the ocean. It's like, no, because that's not how you get or give COVID. Oh, completely. Um, I just want to push back on a viewer is alleging that, um, or, or I guess a viewer is commenting that not everyone in the U.S. has access to testing. I am pretty sure they do. Um, mm -hmm. We have we have mail order testing like through like LabCorp, for example. Um, and like I use Pixel Test by LabCorp. They're really good. I know Everly well. What, also what do they cost a diagnostic you? Test. They're covered by my insurance. If you okay. paid out of pocket, I think it would be a hundred or a hundred ten dollars. So access is an interesting thing because there's, you know, it's sort of two pronged. There's is the person literally able to get it, and then there's the other component, which is, it? you know, can the standard person afford it, or are some right. people perhaps, you know, unable to do that? If you have insurance, it is pretty easy to get access to mail order tests. If you are comfortable paying out of pocket, it is pretty easy to get access to to mail order tests. There is also the free clinic option, which I would imagine somebody, uh, you know, in a more remote remote area or without health insurance or all these different things. People in the Midwest and South don't. I don't understand what you're talking about. I, like, I'm. Are you saying mail can't be delivered to their houses or that nearby clinic? Often, because we're talking about a few different things. We're talking about being able to go to a physical location and getting testing done, which, you know, sometimes a free clinic, sometimes a place that you pay for, sometimes you're a general practitioner. Right, and maybe they live 80 miles from something. Okay, yeah, but you can get things in the mail. I mean, I would be I want to I wanna take this more seriously, though, because sure, for us, social sure. testing as the way to normalcy and the way to social gathering for people, I want I want to, at least the people that I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of, like, some of my good friends, in, you know, it was like, hey, like, do you guys spend time with people? And they're like, oh, no. Or And I'm like, okay, well, do you have access to testing? Or, or do you test yourselves regularly? And they're like, well, also no. And I'm like, no, like, you really should do yeah. that. Like, that's the way to engage in more normal behavior. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to mention something that I probably will apply to maybe no one, um, but it's something that I just learned. So my daughter is half Native American. She lives here in New York City, but she's going to Oklahoma on a job for two months. And um, she saw a picture of her cousin on Instagram who's like not even 40. And he's like, oh, yeah, I got my, and he's full blood native. I got my, both of my vaccines. And she's like, how'd you get your vaccines, dude? Like he's got no comorbidities. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, if you're, um, if you're native and you've got your, you know, your CDIB card or your tribal role card, which she does because she's half, oh, cool. um, you awesome. can come and get it. But you got to get in Oklahoma. She's like, I happen to be going there. So I think that there's. I'm like, uh, there's no way. I'm like last on the list to get it. I got no comorbidities. I'm not old enough. You're like, way older than I am. I'm I know, last on the list. But I'm not I? old enough, right? I, but so, I could get pregnant and then I would be old I, 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 Or at least New York, New York would, would allow me to do it. If, if you were if pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, if, we're, if there's any Native American, I mean, you if there's Natives here, they probably know this already. But it, it, it's nice that there are lots of, like, lots and lots of ways to get the vaccine. Yeah. And and more every single day. I mean, someone was saying, like, oh, by July, we're all going to be get it. And then I think it was Peter Suderman's, like, try April. Yeah. Try April. And I and I would, I'm not, I'm not trying to push back on the person that said in the Midwest and the South. Yeah, no, get it I sense, want to But I'd like to know, like, why... Yeah. How, what what have you tried to get it and what road I really would what like to know barriers? what roadblocks you've come into because that's something interesting for us to look into yeah absolutely. And to maybe write about no I don't mean to be in any way like pugnacious or uh you know whatever like I I just I'm I'm truly 
it's interesting to me because there's also this component of like the COVID experience has been different based off of the region that you live in. And I know this firsthand because I, I mean, not that they're super, super different regions, but like I started off in Austin, Texas, sort of this blue bubble uh, amid a red state. And then I moved to New York in the middle of the pandemic, which is like crazy and ill-advised and whatever. It's been awesome. It's also been terrible at times. Um, but and, and yeah, it's 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 an interesting experience because I got to see how Texans generally this like very chill Austinite Matthew McConaughey esque demographic deals with it, and I got to see how wealthy liberal coastal elite New Yorkers deal with it. And then also like I live in Bed Stuy, and let's just be clear, like there is a little bit of. I guess there are cultural differences in mask adherence and mask wearing and what type of mask culture exists. And this is something that the New York Times has sort of broken down by neighborhood, not by race or ethnicity. But I find it fascinating, like adoption of mask wearing in Flushing and Sunset Park and Chinatown, according to the New York Times, has been much better than other parts of New York because I think, of the Asian population. Because well, the, the Asian population, population often wears masks anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. My, my, I have only lived in Chinatown a year and a half. But yeah, I mean, it's just like, just sort of a more common thing. So when everybody had to put on a mask, I'm just going to see with my terrible eyesight. Um, Coco I, says, hi, Nancy. That's Coco, honey. <laughs> maybe I brought something back from Mexico for you and your dad can bring you over. And know. it's not the virus. And, I'm, <laughs> and it's not COVID. So come on over. I'll give it to Coco you. Coco doesn't give a shit. I don't know. I've never I, met her. I don't know if she gives a shit about COVID. I, she likes when I give her presents. I mean, so, no, yeah. I, I, I feel like she yeah. wouldn't give a shit about COVID. I mean, that's that's actually she the takeaway. She does, though. No, really? that's true. She's had, I mean, I love this kid. And she's, you know, she definitely has, Um, it hasn't been fun. Like, yeah, yeah I mean, Matt's written about this before. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're, you're seeing your child go from four to five to six. And like, oh, yeah, it's very, very, it's difficult. And she's a great, think, joyous kid, but it's still, it's, it's, it's hard. This is something I realized. So I have younger siblings, actually, who are like, I'm more their aunt than their sister because I'm so much older than them. But when I was in Texas this past month, I was living back with my siblings and my parents um, for a little bit. My husband and I stayed there because of the actually like the emergency crisis, natural disaster situation in Texas, where basically people lost power oh, for man. a bunch of days. Oh, man. Yeah. Was so it rough. was crazy. Um but so basically we were like, we need to consolidate households. We're going to go to my parents' house. Um, and it was really awesome and interesting to watch my littlest brother, who was nine years old. Like for him, I, I was even thinking about this. He's worn a mask out, out in public for a ninth of his life for an entire year. He's nine years old. It's a ninth of his life. And he doesn't even notice it. He is so adaptable. Oh. There has been a loss, you know, in terms of social interaction. But it was fascinating to me. You know, he would come back indoors and he would need to be reminded, like, hey, like, dude, you can take your mask off. Like, you're indoors now. But he was so obsessed with, he has cowboy boots just like I do. Um, his are, like, a little bit cooler. I'm wearing mine right now. Uh, but he matches his mask to his cowboy boots. And it's the most precious thing in the world. So he considers it to be, like, a style opportunity more than anything. But there's also this wow. really, really sad component, which is like the only reason why he's able to live a more normal life is because he's in private school. And yeah. so he's been able to go to school. I, for They lived in San Francisco and now they, they live in Austin. San Francisco was incredibly like draconian about not allowing the kids to go to even private schools for quite a while. But now that they're in Austin, they can go to school again. Yeah. And the kids wear masks wonderfully. They're nine years old. They do an awesome job. Yeah, It was heartening to see, okay, the the he hasn't borne the brunt of this burden because of the specific situation that he's in, but a whole bunch of other kids, like that is not true for them. And no. that's unacceptable. No, it is. Um, I think I'm going to call it. Yeah. I'm okay. Uh, Good. Lizzie has other things to do. I, I do too tonight. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're going to keep trying to put out some fun content for you. And also, um, so Clubhouse, 5 p.m. on Mondays, Eastern time. Um, Lizzie and I are, are there talking and um, it's been fun. So, um, Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you guys so much. Bye. See you soon.